Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a woman clerk and a customer at a cell phone store. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning. What can I help you with today? Well, I've just moved here and I need to get a new cell phone number. OK. We've got both prepaid plans and 24-month contract plans. I'll only be here for a year, so I think a prepaid plan is better. Can you tell me something about those? Of course. We've got a number of different plans. But first of all, I should just mention that none of them come with handsets. You'll just be buying a SIM card, and you can replace the one in your old phone. Yes, that's perfect. So how much are the SIM cards? Well, the expense isn't really in the card. To use it, you'll need to set up a plan, and that can range from just over $10 a month upwards. The card itself is just $2, and that gives you about 15 minutes of local calls. Okay. I knew I'd need a new plan from you guys, but I don't have much money at the moment. Can you tell me about the cheaper plans? Yes. Our least expensive is the minimal plan. That's only $12 a month. That's good. But it's for someone who doesn't use their phone very much. You only get 40 minutes a month of talking time. Ah. How about Internet access with that one? No, sorry, that's not included. No. Nope. No, that plan's not for me. I'll definitely need to go online. For browsing the net? Or for things like Facebook and WeChat? Mostly social media. It's how I keep in touch with people back home. Well, we do have what we call a social plan. That might really suit you. You get unlimited data on social media websites. That sounds great. How much is that one? That's $40 a month. But you get 200 minutes of talking time, 500 texts, and 2 gigabytes of data which is about 15 hours of watching videos and thousands of photo uploads. <laughs> well, I do upload lots of photos for my friends back home, so that's fine. But I'm worried that I'll need more text than that. Do you have any plans with unlimited texting? Well, there is one other plan. On that one, you choose five people or five phone numbers, and you can talk to or text them as much as you want. That's called the Friends and Family Plan. Okay. That sounds like the one for me. What's the catch? Well, it's not exactly cheap. That plan costs $70 a month, but it does come with 3 gigabytes and unlimited texts, as well as your five designated people. That's a bit too pricey for me, but I do like it. Can I choose a cheaper plan now and change after I find a job? Oh yes, you can just come in and let us know whenever you like. It's also possible to log into our website and manage your account yourself online. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Okay, I think the social media plan is the best option for the time being. Great, so we'll set you up today. We'll just fill in this sales form. Here's your new SIM card. I'll just need to record the number for you. Can you read me that number on the top left-hand side of the card? It's your new phone number. Uh, yes. It's zero four seven eight double seven nine two double three. Okay, I got it. So remember, that's your new number, so you should write it down as well so you can inform your contacts. 
Hold on to this package that the sim comes in. There's information on that about how to contact us, you know, just in case your phone gets lost or something like that. Oh, yes, that's important. So next, I'll need your name. Sure. It's Stephen. That's Stephen with a V. And my surname is Conway. That's C-O-N-W-A-Y. Okay, that's cool. And your address, please? Well, at the moment, I'm living in temporary accommodation. Once I've found work, I'll be moving to a different place. Do you think that matters? Well, not really for now. But please let us know when you get a permanent address, okay? Yes, fine. So I'll give you my current address for now, then. It's 375 Thompson Avenue. Is that spelled T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N? Yes, that's right. It's in Green Park. Ah, yes. Okay. So the total for today is $42.50. That's the SIM card and the first month's plan. So just to confirm, I'll be able to get the SIM card today and start using it immediately? Yep. You've got the SIM card already. Oh, yeah, right. Sorry. Now let me see if I have enough cash. Uh, 10, 20, 30. No, 50, 30. No, it doesn't look like I have enough. I guess I'll have to put it on my credit card. Here you are. No problem. Just a moment. So just sign here, please. Now, do you want help putting the SIM card into your phone? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide talking to a group of tourists who are visiting a cave in Vietnam. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning everyone. Welcome to our visit to one of the most famous caves in Vietnam. As you know, this cave is famous for its wildlife, and one of the creatures you will observe in here is the small cave cockroach. They live mostly on the bird and bat droppings that are so plentiful in the caves. The guard rails along the trails are covered with these droppings, and this makes a feast for the cockroaches. So be careful where you put your hands. They will not harm you, but it can be a shock if you touch them. Once you're in one of the main caves, look out for the green centipedes. They will not be on the trail, but can often be seen on the wall close by. They feed on other insects and are fascinating to look at because of their colour and, of course, their many legs. Please, please do not try to pick one up, though. These centipedes have a very nasty, poisonous bite. There are also deep red millipedes. These have a fully rounded shape, and they look like a streamlined, elongated train, with a hundred or so closely packed legs extending right and left. When you get to the large, high caves, you should look right up above you for the swifts and bats. The bats in this cave are mostly a type of dwarf bat, which are common in this part of the world. They will be clustered high up against the walls, maybe a hundred or two hundred together. They look like shadows high on the walls of the cave. They are likely to be very quiet right now, but because there are so many of them together, you will have no difficulty identifying them. They sleep all day, 
until they all leave the cave in a massive flock on their nightly hunt for flying insects. The swifts are the creatures you can see flying around during the day, especially if they have young ones to feed. They can navigate in the darkness here, and will fly outside in ones and twos at dusk to catch small winged insects like mosquitoes. However, they tend to return before it's pitch black outside, and they do not hunt at night. The swifts make nests, usually higher up on the ceiling of the cave. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. The paths tend to run around the edges of the large caves. Mostly this is because the centre is a mound of guano, the bird and bat droppings. This is also the source of the strong smell inside the caves. You may not like this smell, but the locals know its economic value. They have harvested the products of these caves for centuries. The guano is very valuable as fertilizer, and so it's collected each year, once the young birds have grown and the swifts have abandoned their nests. The guano is not the only valuable by-product of the wildlife here. As you travel through the caves, you will notice some bamboo structures. These very flimsy-looking sets of poles that go a full hundred metres right up to the roof, are what the locals climb up to gather the swifts' nests. These are even more valuable than the guano, as they are the main ingredient in bird's nest soup. Before you begin, it's time for some safety instructions. As you probably know, this is a huge limestone cave that goes about one kilometre back into the hills, and in places it's a hundred metres in height, and 300 metres wide. There's no need to crawl around in here as you do in other caves, but it's dark inside, of course. That's why I insisted you bring a working light. Please check that it shines brightly, and ensure that you stay together with others who have a good torch. In one of the larger areas of the cave, the roof is pierced, so some sunlight will get through. It is best to turn your torches off if you can see well and save your batteries. It's a good idea to put your waterproof jacket on now. The walls may be wet, but that's not the main reason for the jacket. The bats and birds do excrete, and they're above you, so just in case. And of course, your hat or hood also keeps you safe from animal droppings. It's not advisable to use the guard rails as handholds. There are lots of droppings on those rails, and don't forget the cockroaches. You absolutely must follow the marked trails. The guard rails on either side are put there so that you cannot mistake them. We take no responsibility for your safety if you go over or under the rails into other cave areas. Keep your torches shining on the path whenever you are moving, just to be sure of your footing, and don't try to go too fast. You might trip, and you will certainly miss some of the fascinating wildlife in the cave. Now, it's time to begin the tour. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a science tutor and two first-year students who are being given some practical tips for conducting experiments. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Now, Vincent and Tessa, I've asked the two of you to come and see me because I'm a bit concerned after that incident in the science lab last week. I realise that neither of you have had much experience in a laboratory before. Well, we mostly just studied theory at high school. And we rarely got the opportunity to carry out any experiments. Fair enough. But we must all abide by certain safety procedures. The last thing we want is for one of our students to get hurt. We understand that. Our priority is to make sure that the chemistry laboratory is a safe place. And actually, accidents can easily be prevented if you just think about what you're doing at all times. It sounds simple enough. It is if you always use good judgment, observe safety rules, and follow directions. We've read the rules on the poster inside the lab. And yet last week you were seen working in the lab without eye protection. What do you mean? I was wearing my glasses. Prescription glasses are not safety glasses. You must always wear the goggles provided. You'll find they fit quite comfortably over your ordinary glasses. Oh, I see. Just make a habit of putting them on before you start and keep them on until you are finished. And another thing, never eat or drink while in the laboratory. What? Not even water? Not even water. At least not until after clean-up. Then be sure to wash your hands thoroughly with soap and hot water and dry them on a clean towel first. And Tessa, your hair should be tied back when you're in the lab. It's not that long. Still, it poses a hazard when you're working with chemicals or a naked flame. If you can't tie it back or pin it up, see if you can tuck it into a cap or something. Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Now, Vincent, last week you wore a T-shirt and trainers in the lab. The rules clearly state that long-sleeved shirts and leather shoes must be worn. Oh, yes, I remember. I was late getting back from sports practice and I didn't have time to change. Well, it mustn't happen again. OK, I'll see that it doesn't. Good. As for the rest of the safety precautions, refer to the safety poster inside the lab and you shouldn't have any problems. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, before you go, a word about record keeping. Oh, good. I was going to ask you about that. What's the best way to keep track of what we're doing in the lab? Well, obviously, all your observations should be written down. I know you think you won't forget stuff and you'll be able to recall it later, but generally this turns out not to be the case. Written data, however, are a permanent record, and you must be thorough. Organise and record everything in a bound notebook. I use a spiral notebook. And I use a large notepad. That won't do. A book with binding ensures the pages are not easily removed or lost. Oh, and be sure to write your entries in complete sentences. Isn't that a waste of time? Surely notes are good enough. You might think so. But brief notes can be hard to decipher at a later date. Whereas with full sentences, you are less likely to misinterpret data. I make sketches, you know, simple drawings. That's a good idea, Vincent, but be sure to date them. You want us to write the date next to each drawing? Yes. Every sketch and every entry must be dated. What about headings? Use the title of the experiment as your first entry. When you have completed your observation entries, answer any questions that have been posed, and then, finally, write your conclusion. How do we write a conclusion? Do we need to repeat things like the questions and our findings, or the time it all took? 
Just write your own ideas or feelings about the experiment as the conclusion. Oh, and remember to sign it. Well, that's all I have time for today. If you have any questions, ask the lab assistant or come back to me. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on the importance of soil in organic agriculture. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to this talk on soil science and organic farming. Dirt, soil, earth, loam, mud, or dust—it doesn't matter what you call it—is of primary importance in the production of food and other crops. Most people think of it just as a substrate or medium in which plants grow, but it's more than that. It's actually a living entity. Or it should be if it's healthy, and human health is affected by the health of the soil. Healthy, living soil is literally crawling with life. There are the obvious earthworms, which burrow in the soil and help to aerate and improve it, beetles and other hard-backed insects, and various invertebrates like centipedes. Then there are fungi and bacteria, also living forms. Healthy soil needs food, air, and water to help plants grow. And the more nutrients in plants, the more available for humans and livestock. It stands to reason, therefore, that plants grown in poor soil will have few nutrients to pass on to the consumer, whose well-being will be worse off over the long term. So, where do plants get their nourishment? Most of it comes from the soil. Some nutrients are made up of minerals from the earth, while others come from dead plant and animal matter. Which is broken down over time by the living insects and other organisms in the soil. Plants depend on these little living creatures to convert minerals and other vital elements into a utilizable form that can be taken up by the plants. And it's a synergistic relationship. In turn, the plants assist those helpful organisms by releasing sugars and enzymes back into the soil. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions. Before I go any further, let's take a look at the structure of soil. Now, if you look at the diagram, you will see that soil is made up of many different layers. Let's start at the bottom. This is the bedrock under all the other layers. The layer above that is called regolith. Here, the bedrock is slightly broken up, but plant roots don't penetrate this layer. Moving up the chart to the next layer. We come to the subsoil, which contains clay and mineral deposits. On top of that is the alluviation or leaching layer. This is quite light in colour and is mostly just sand and silt. As we get near the surface, we find the topsoil. You will hear a lot of talk about topsoil amongst farmers and other agriculturalists. 
It's the most important layer of all because it's where seeds germinate and roots grow. Now, at the top of the chart, you will see a comparatively thin layer. This is organic matter that is still in the process of decomposition. It mostly consists of leaf litter and humus. Just think of the surface of the forest floor. Partly decayed leaves and twigs, that sort of thing. As you can imagine, good soil forms very slowly over time, but it can be lost very rapidly through erosion. And, in addition, soil quality can be affected by pollution due to anything from industrial waste to the artificial fertilizers used by conventional farmers, which have been shown to suppress the diverse life forms in the soil. This is why organic agriculture is the way of the future. Let's take a quick look at the conventional system, which is often based on monoculture, the production of a single large crop. It relies on chemicals for fertilizer and pest control. It is also becoming an increasingly common practice to use genetically engineered seeds. And more chemicals are used to control insects and fungi, which attack crops in storage and during transportation. Also, did you know that there is no requirement for conventional growers to maintain records of their production practices? Organic growers, on the other hand, choose the most environmentally friendly options for dealing with pests and disease problems, working towards prevention in the first place. Some of the strategies they employ include alternating the crops grown in each field, as opposed to monocropping. Because different plants add different nutrients to the soil, by rotating crops, the soil is naturally replenished. This can do away with the need for pesticides, because the problem insects' life cycles are naturally interrupted. Surrounding crops with green waste can not only conserve moisture in the soil, but it can prevent weeds from springing up, and it also feeds the beneficial microorganisms. When it's ploughed under, it feeds the soil by building more organic matter. Organic farmers often release beneficial insects as predators, which precludes the need for artificial pesticides. Animal manure, combined with green waste materials correctly composted to kill pathogens and weed seeds, fertilises the soil in a way that encourages life rather than suppressing it. And, by the way, use of manure in organic farming is highly regulated. In fact, all agricultural inputs are evaluated for their long-term effects on the environment, regardless of whether they are synthetic or natural. To sum up, organic farming is the only sustainable way of feeding the people on this planet and keeping both the planet and the people in good health. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.